Welcome to Valley Politics. I'm Terry Christensen, your host for this new show on politics and public policy in Silicon Valley and the South Bay. You may know that this area was once called the feminist capital of the United States because so many women held elected office here. That's not the case today, however. To help us ponder this phenomenon, our guests are Zoe Lofgren, who represents this area in Congress, and Angelica Ramos, who is president of the National Women's Political Caucus of Silicon Valley. We'll also have an update from City Council member Pierluigi Olverio on what's going on in Council District 6, that's the Willow Glen area. And on our Where Are They Now feature, we'll have part two of our visit with Susie Wilson, who was a City Council member and County Supervisor from 1973 to 1990. All this next on Valley Politics. Welcome everyone and welcome Angelica Ramos, President of the National Women's Political Caucus, Silicon Valley, and Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren, an office holder in this area since 1979. Thank you both for joining us today for this conversation about women candidates and women elected officials. Uh, before we get into that though, Zoe, tell us what got you into politics, what, what, what got you interested, what, what impelled you to eventually run for office? Well, I don't know. Uh I mean, I was always interested in politics. I wa walked my first precinct when I was five with my mother. <laughs> um, and we always were, you know, working in campaigns and talking over dinner, the whole family about it. So I just sort of grew up with that part of life. That's what everyone did, I thought. I found out later that not everyone did. <clears throat> when I um, graduated from college, I went to Washington just kind of to save the world and mm -hmm. ended up uh, talking my way into a job with Congressman Don Edwards and ended up working for him for over eight years. Went to law school while I was on his staff and uh. um, eventually got recruited uh, by teachers to run for the community college board and then the rest is history. So the community college board was your start. I think That's school correct. boards are a start for a lot of women yes. in politics. Before we ask Angelica to answer what the question about how she got engaged in politics, we have to ask you how your last trip home on Air Force One was. Well, it really beats United Airlines. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, Congresswoman Anna Eshoo, myself, and uh, Congressman Eric Swalwell uh, flew uh, out on Air Force One. Well, the three of us also attended the cybersecurity speech the president gave at Stanford. Mm -hmm. The trip was, you know, very nice. I mean, we worked on the plane. The president came back and spent, you know, 45 minutes just chatting with us, and it was fun to be able to pitch him on a few ideas that we had. And uh, the rest of his staff, and uh, uh, you know, Valerie Jarrett and Susan Rice, who were coming out, and other staff people, and. Alejandro Mayorkas, who is a great guy, who's the uh, Under Secretary of Homeland Security, but mm -hmm. used to head USCIS, and we were able to talk a little bit about immigration. So it was a great trip, and the President was very gracious to us. Good. Well, I hope you have many more trips on Air Force One. Well, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Angelica, let's go back to what got, got you engaged in politics. What motivated you to become an activist? Well, you know, I was uh, like the Congresswoman, I've always been involved with politics. Uh, my parents, <coughs> um, I was supposed to be born in the Philippines and I wasn't because my parents had to flee. Uh, in August of 1983, there was uh, an assassination on the tarmac there and mm -hmm, my yeah. father was convinced that they were going to kill my mother with me in, him, in her. So she, he sent us to the United States and um, my dad basically, and my mom and my dad actually, just basically said that, you know, I was very fortunate. So we should always give back to the community and um, always uh, fight for equality for everyone because that's what they left behind. I think families always have a lot to do with motivating people to engage in politics. It was my grandmother started taking me to county commission meetings back in Kansas oh. when, probably when I was about five years old. See? Yeah. And, and kept dragging me there for, for many years. So I've always been particularly interested in local government. Yes. And speaking of local government, you both know that San Jose was once known as the feminist capital of the oh. United States back in the 70s and 80s. 
Uh, during that time, and Zoe, you were an office holder then. Right. During that time, there was a majority of women on the San Jose City Council. There was a majority of women on the County Board of Supervisors. That seems to have changed. Today, men outnumber women on both of those boards. We did a little research on County Boards of Supervisors statewide, and the number of women county supervisors is actually a little lower than it was in 2002, mm -hmm. so no progress there. And the same thing is true in the state legislature. It's yeah. the lowest number of women since, the, since sometime in the 1990s. What do you think's been happening? Why this decline of women elected officials, this decline in their number? Well, I think there are a number of factors. I mean, I would say that there are now 100 women in the Congress, which is an all-time high. It's still pretty low, but the highest number. I think, um, weirdly enough, term limits had a very negative impact hmm. on women in office. <clears throat> One of the things that women candidates oftentimes have a hard time doing is raising money. And uh, obviously, you have to have some funds to run a campaign. I mean, my campaigns always were volunteer uh, heavy, but you still have to have money to buy signs and send mail and the like. Um, it's really hard when you're, for the first time, trying to raise campaign funds. It's easier when you're an incumbent to raise campaign funds. So with term limits, you've got the incumbents going out and the, and the more difficult mm -hmm. time of having to raise as a non-elected uh, official. And I think that's had a very uh, deleterious impact on women candidates. Term, li <coughs> term limits actually <coughs> opened the door for women candidates when they were first imposed. That's right. Because there were a lot of men who'd been in office that's forever correct. and ever had to be termed out. But then it sort of backfired, I guess, as I you're, think it you're did. saying. I think it did. And, um, and then also, I mean, each time has its own era. I mean, we had Janet Gray Hayes as mayor of the city of San Jose, and she had such a powerful impact on other women. She certainly helped me uh, by appointing me to commissions and boards and giving me an opportunity to shine and uh, become somebody that people would think of as an elected official, and no one really did what she did. Other people have helped, but she was a remarkable person. Yes, she was. We'll come back to that, I think. Angelica, what do you think about the decline in number of women? You've worked for women candidates. You've got some real on-the-ground experience. What's going on? Um, I have worked for successful and unsuccessful uh, female candidates, <coughs> and a lot of the problem, uh, in my opinion, is in addition to lack of funding, um, it's lack of support. Um, there are women out there who will run for office and just be raked over the coals in um, news outlets and um, just public opinion because women in general have to be likable and qualified in order for, in order for them to be moderately successful uh, in a campaign. Men generally just have to be likable. But that's not new, is it? I no. mean, I suppose not. No, <coughs> not particularly. Um, it's very much so. Uh, has to do a lot with not having a structure for a pipeline um, because generally speaking men are generally told when they're younger oh my god you're gonna be president it's gonna be awesome and younger women or little girls are told that they're so pretty um, and so I think if we just start changing the conversation into teaching all children that they can be anything they want to be we could probably start changing the conversation in, for that generation what if we had a woman president? Would that have the effect on uh, an effect on women running for office like Janet Gray Hayes did locally? Oh, I think definitely would. I mean, <clears throat> people look to role models, and uh, until uh, President Obama was elected, when you said President of the United States, you thought of a white male because um, every single president had been in that category, and now you don't think only that. And uh, but it's only one gender. And if we have a female president, I think people uh, across the country will have a more expansive idea of who, who the president can be. And that will mean who can be in public office will be expanded as well. Before we go on, I want to kind of take us back to a, a basic question, because uh, the implicit content of, of our question uh, today is that there should be more women in elected office. Do you both agree with that? And why would that be a good thing? Angelica, you start. In general, like, yes, duh. <laughs> yes, more women would be great, 50-50 all the way, you know. Um, 
And the reason why is because women in general have a different experience than men. I mean, it's sort of obvious um, when you break it down like that and simplistic, but they do have a different viewpoint. They can talk about and understand the struggle of um, needing universal childcare um, or paid parental leave or um, anything that would affect the economy. Women are very much so in tune to what would make that uh, move for this for society as a whole. When you take a look at the uh, Congress, I will say that there's more difference between uh, who, which party you're registered in than which gender you are. Mm. Um, you know, the Republican women are not advocates for uh, child care or for family leave. Um, here, lo locally, uh, almost all the elected officials are Democrats. I mean, there are a, you know, a scattering of Republicans, but pretty much on the same wavelength politically. And I think locally, with everybody on kind of the same wavelength, you do see the difference between a male and female candidates. Not that the, that the male office holders are opposed to women's issues, but they may not be thinking about it as naturally mm -hmm. as their colleagues who are female. We asked 20 smart, competent women who we know <laughs> why they wouldn't consider running for public office. Here's some of the answers. Did you get a question like that? I did not. I did not either. Well, she's already in office, and we know you're going to run someday anyway. Okay. Uh, so some of the answers were family commitments. Yep. That was the most common one, especially for younger women. Uh, loss of privacy, the negativity of current campaigning, mm -hmm. and access to resources, especially money. Would you mm -hmm. add to that list? or? scratch some things off it? I think those are all true, but they're not new, and I, that would be true for a lot of uh, men as well. I know men who think, you know, they can't run because their kids are small, mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, they, they need to earn more money before they can afford to go take the pay cut and, and do a public uh, office thing. Uh, I do think that the negativity has reached um, new heights. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first ran, uh, you know, the the Community College Board was not a heavy ideological bent, but when I ran for the Board of Supervisors, I think you'll recall that I, uh, there were some hit pieces and the like, but nothing compared to the kind of sliming that goes on uh, in political campaigns today, and that's a real turnoff for people. You know, whenever people ask me if I would run, I, I emphatically say no, um, partly because I, um, I like being behind the scenes, and another part is that you know, if I have kids in the future, I wouldn't want to, I can already foresee a lot of the negative hits, and I don't anticipate the positive hits to counter that. <laughs> another, you know, another reason why is because there's a lot of just, in general, gender bias. Uh, lots of women get asked questions that men don't get asked, like, what are you wearing? Um, or how how was it able like how are you able to raise your kids um, etc. I'm wearing Perry Ellis today. Oh you well, look very in, nice. In you case, do. In case you want to. You look very nice. We're just about out of time, but there's still an important question, and that is what could be done to encourage more women to run for office. You know, I think it's as simple as this: encourage the idealism that people have inside of them. You know, there's been so much negativity, and I think it's almost a campaign to mm -hmm. make people feel that what they do doesn't make a difference. It's not true. And I think that looking back at my own life, you know, it's not always that easy to run for office, to be in office, and yet it's highly rewarding if you can make a difference for the country and for people. And uh, if people can just reach in and, and, and feel that sense of optimism, then the other things don't really matter. Well said, Angelica. I would have to agree as well. And also, you know, activate our networks and ask them to kind of just say, no, that's not okay to, to throw around slime if, or negative hits. And just, you know, even if they're not your, fr like your friend or who you support, just, I mean, I feel as if, if we provide a strong support system for women, um, they would feel more comfortable putting themselves out there. Okay. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. Now let's hear what some Valley residents have to say about today's topic. And then later, we'll hear from San Jose City Councilman Pierluigi Oliverio on what's going on in his council district number six. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Michaela Davis for Valley Politics, and today's question is, why do you think there aren't more women elected officials here in this area? Well, I, I think running for office takes a huge amount of time and public appearance and um, it's something many women just don't can't fit into their into their life and it's sad because um, we have very, very capable able women that that should be more active in leading um, our government. Well, I just believe historically that women weren't as involved in politics because they didn't have the same rights. So maybe that's still becoming a, a factor nowadays, especially in this area where there's very large tech companies. There's not too many women who are in charge of those. So politically, they're not as you know forceful as men. You know, a lot of people, I think it might start kind of young and they got to get started younger. And maybe we need to focus on educating girls to be a little bit more empowered so maybe it's not so much why aren't the women who are you know here now running it's maybe so much it's more let's focus on our youth and and get them and get the ideas into their minds early maybe they, they don't think they're going to get elected sometimes you don't go after something if you don't think you're liable to get it I'm Michaela Davis for Valley Politics. See you next time. Hi, my name is Para Luigi Oliverio. I'm a council member in San Jose representing District 6. District 6 covers the areas of Willow Glen, Rose Garden, and Santana Row. The recent highlights, we opened the second new, brand new grocery store in District 6, Whole Foods on the Alameda. Beautiful store, great architecture, fresh food for the neighborhood, as well as uh, a brewery. It's going to be a catalyst for development on the Alameda and bring in more revenue for our city. Next, we opened Del Monte Park in the Midtown area, which is on Osre near Sonol. This new park, which has been incredibly popular, uh, has a major focus of two dog runs, one for small, one for large. So every one of Canine Companions has been coming to the park and they really love it. And on February 24th, the City Council will be voting to triple the size of the park by using District 6 Parks funds, which come from fees that residential developers pay for market rate housing and we're going to buy the four acre parcel and install athletic fields in 2017. These athletic fields will most likely be a soccer field for both youth and adult sport. And finally, in economic development, Santana Row is coming forward for a proposal to be approved by council this year for an additional 500,000 square feet of office space. Not only will this bring revenue to the city to pay for basic city services, it'll also provide places to work in San Jose rather than our residents driving up the peninsula. This is a really good opportunity for San Jose and uh, this is the most recent and best updates for the district. If you'd like to contact me, please call me or probably email is best, paraluigi.oliverio at sanjoseca.gov or sjdistrict6.com. Thank you so much. Now it's time for Where Are They Now? Today we present the second part of our exclusive interview with Susie Wilson who served on the San Jose City Council from 1973 to 1978 and represented South County on the Board of Supervisors from 1979 to 1990. I think you'll see that Susie's knowledge and experience will be an inspiration to younger women in politics. Let's take a look. When you were elected to the city council at large, so that meant you yes. were elected citywide, the whole city yes. of San Jose. Yes. Before you left the council in 78, you endorsed a change in the way we elect our yes. city council to districts. Yes. Why did you think we needed to do that in San Jose? Well, if you looked at the history of the city council, uh, until Virginia Shaver, who was the first woman that came on, on the city council, it was all men, mm -hmm. all white men, all men from either the Rose Garden or Willow Glen. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was the establishment, and uh, when Janet Gray then was elected after Virginia Schaefer, and they didn't like her, they didn't like Virginia Schaefer, and then I was going to be the second woman on the city council. And it was still all white men, except there was one person, Normanetta, who was on the council. And in that time I was on the council at the same time, when there, we had a general plan that we were supposed to be a citywide first general plan, really of the citizens 
and they were talking a great deal about diversity and everybody got up and said you should do this, you should have some minorities on that general plan. And there, was a, there were two blacks on the, put on the general plan. Everybody had two appointments. Those two blacks, I, here I am from Willow Glen, those two blacks who were from the east side, mm -hmm. and I was the only one who appointed a minority. That's where we were in those days. And one of those people I had met in meetings at the city council, her name was Iola Williams. So that, that was a way that I didn't like what was happening, so I, I endorsed an a election by council uh, districts because it's the only way we're ever going to have diversity on the council. Your next step, you left the council yes. in 1978, you ran for county supervisor, served yes. there till 1990. What made you want to make that jump from city to county? I was really concerned about the people's lives, the social happenings of what was happening in the people's lives. The city of San Jose was interested in uh, where you build your house and, and development and police and fire and the things that protect a city. I wanted to protect the people and I wanted to help change people's lives. The county does that, not the city. And all the social work and all the, you mm -hmm. know, everything that affects a, a human being is at the county. And I wanted to do that. I wanted to make lives better, not property. What do you think your biggest accomplishment was as a county supervisor? Oh gosh. 12 years. 12 years. It really revolved, interesting enough, I'm talking about savings and changing people's lives, but it really involved the budgets. Hmm. I, I became the guru of budgets as well as together once more we were a team, Bob Brownstein. Bob Brownstein, and I, yeah. He, had a, he has a great mathematical mind and he could ferret out where all the money was hidden that the departments were saving for the next year by some means. And so at budget time, I was the one who balanced the budget on an envelope. I'd have a white envelope there and I kept tally. I also understood where all the other council members were failing to supervisors. get. Supervisors. Excuse me, yeah. supervisors were failing to get what they wanted for the district in some ways, maybe <laughs> a social service or, or maybe it was an organization. And I kind of kept track in my mind. So on the last day, I always balanced the budget on an envelope. I became the chair of the audit committee. The Valley Medical Center, when I came on the board, had not been audited in three years because it was inaudible, if that's a word. <laughs> Unaudible, Impossible. I guess is the word. Yeah. Uh, and, and I became the, the champion of Valley Medical Center. And I still am. I'm still on the foundation that was organized, which I helped create with uh, Brenna Bolger's help years ago. But I, I knew I was also a minor in math. I knew budgets. I knew how to count. And I knew how to help other people get what they wanted. Just so everybody knows, you were a minor in math, but she was a major in political science Absol at San well, Jose after, State University. Yes. I, well, actually, I had five majors. I had, <laughs> I, some I haven't told you That's about. That's typical of San Jose State students, actually. Yeah, no, yeah. But I did that because I, and I got my degree from my mother after I was on the city council. Yeah. 1976. Yes, I, I remember. Did. Yes. What about a big disappointment on the county board? What was your biggest disappointment? It's it's still a disappointment today. Um, believe it or not, it's alcoholism. It is. I I was a social drinker. I have a glass of wine, and I there I was paying five million dollars to try to help people get well, to get off of alcohol, and it. It just, I felt like a hypocrite. I would sign a resolution praising somebody for doing something. And then have a drink. Uh, and I just, I stopped drinking. I stopped drinking during the campaign and I never drank again. And I still today, we're killing people. We're killing people on the roads because of alcohol. And we're killing our young people. And that to me, this society, who we, we worry about uh, five people who maybe die of some disease, but we kill people on the highways that shouldn't be killed. You were on the city council and the county board of supervisors when San Jose was known as the feminist capital of the yes. United States. So there was a majority of yes. women on the county board. There was a majority of women for almost two decades on the San Jose city council. Today there's one woman out of five mm -hmm. county supervisors and three women out of 11 mm -hmm. members of the city council. What do you think happened? Well, if you look at the time, yeah, of course, uh, 
the first thing that happened was I it was Betty Friedan, which I never even read a book. I didn't have to. I was already a feminist <laughs> from from the time my mother, who was a school teacher, taught me that just by her, her the way she lived her life. But it it was a time when the pay was not that good. Women weren't working, and they could they could uh, if they were working they could leave their job and take a lesser pay, and so that. Uh, Men couldn't afford to be on city council by the 70s and by the 80s mm. or 80s and 90s because there were two, two jobs in a home. And those offices paid little or nothing yes. back then. Oh, I got $400 a month. $400 a month. Yeah, okay. yeah, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> but, but nevertheless, uh, so women could, could fill the job and not worry about the pay. Mm. And then, of course, women also then they had to get then begin to get jobs because this became a, a two-job family community, and so they had to work. So you didn't have as many women who had the luxury of giving back to the community full time. Mm -hmm. The pay increased, the pay kept increasing, and of course, more men could run, and they edged out. And women were still having to be the backbone of a lot of families, and there weren't that many women. Who had the luxury, really, of, of doing something as uh, as daring as being on city councils and boards of supervisors? You think there should be more women in office now, right? Of course. How how could you make that happen? What ha what has to be done to make that happen? What has to be done? Um, if you seek out women, and I, I was so proud. Of, you were sought out. Yes, I was sought out. Yeah. You seek out women. I sought out a woman. I sought out a woman to run for the Water District and I found her. I didn't seek out anybody else except I knew what I wanted. And other women have to know what they want in government to be able to help select those people that run. And you also have to have the courage to run more than one time. Back when mm -hmm. I ran, I had a friend who ran. She lost by seven votes, which meant if she'd run again, she would have won. I'm going to ask you to give some advice to a man now. Dave Cortez okay. is going to be the president of the County Board of Supervisors this year. What advice would you give him? Dave has a big heart. He really does. And I, what I would say to him is, you've got the most power, really, of anybody in the county this year. And you need to learn, really, how to use that power until you, reach, you achieve the goal you want to achieve. So you should pick something. Uh, that it's almost impossible to do, and do it. <laughs> I can tell you, you could follow Ken's example. Ken Yeager. Ken Yeager, who is a supervisor who dared to uh, get rid of plastic bags, who dared to do things that nobody's ever done for people uh, in this county. And not only did he get away from it, he was successful, and so we have less plastic bags swirling around in the Pacific Ocean <laughs> because of him. And Dave can do the same thing. He can pick something that he's really wanted to do and follow through and get it done. Great advice. Thanks very much for your time, Susie. This was excellent. Oh, thank you very much. I hope you can see that like Susie, you can make a difference in your community by stepping forward and getting involved. If you'd like to see the first part of this interview, please visit our landing page at createv.org slash valley hyphen politics or send us an email at valleypolitics at createvsj.org. And remember to like us on Facebook and feel free to post your comments about the show and suggest guests or topics you'd like us to address. And now that's all folks. Thanks for watching Valley Politics today. See you next time. Eli Thomas Menswear is a proud sponsor of Valley Politics, Italian contemporary clothing for today's executive lifestyle. Eli Thomas Menswear is located at 350 South Winchester Boulevard, next to Santana Row.